Chapter 1, Exploring the World of Business and Economics. In this chapter, we'll take a look at what business is, the types of resources that are used, the types of economic systems in which it might find itself, and a little bit on measuring economic variables. <clears throat> but before we get into that, I have a couple questions for you. Um, the first is, what do you want to do? Why, why are you studying business? Um, what do you want to do with this? So it's interesting to note that your author suggests writing it down, and you might say, well, I don't really need to write it down. I know what I want to do. But in fact, research has shown that something as simple as writing down your goals on a note card and putting it in your wallet, even if you forget about it, is far more likely to result in achieving those goals than had you not written them down. So I'd invite you to take a moment to really think about what you want to do with this course of study and write down your goals. Um, you might be asking, well, hmm, why study business? I assume a lot of the folks in here are business majors, but even for those who aren't, who might be saying, you know, I really want to study poli-sci and, and or um, pursue a career in the arts, uh, business is still highly, highly relevant to you in that everything that we discuss in here impacts you as a consumer. <clears throat> so a couple of thoughts on studying for the class. It's very, very important to read the chapter before you start um, engaging in the discussion forum or doing homework or the quizzes. Um, you can go back over the lectures before the examination, and I would encourage you to do so. Well, let's think about what is business. Um, Definitionally, it's the organized effort of individuals to produce and sell for a profit the goods and services that satisfy society's needs. And that, that sounds like a very textbook definition. But let's unpack that a little bit. Um, a lot of what we talk about is also applicable to nonprofits, but for the most part, we're going to make the assumption that you are here to make a profit. And that it can't be emphasized enough that it's important, the part about satisfying society's needs. Um, if a business fails to do that, needless to say, they won't be in business for very long. Let's look at some of the four resources, and you'll have an opportunity in your homework exercise to unpack the types of resources that are needed in a business. The human resources, um, who do you need to hire if you're, if you're opening a restaurant? Do you need to hire a chef? Do you need to hire a part marketing person? Do you need to hire wait staff? Um, going along with the, the restaurant thing. Oh, you know, what about material resources? Do you need a pizza oven? Do you need tables? Do you need spatulas? What about information resources? Uh, one of our former chefs used to love to cite horror statistics about folks who have started a restaurant just because they said, I like Thai food. I'm going to start, start a Thai restaurant. Um, and his point was really well taken because the information, the importance of information cannot be overemphasized. So in that type of decision, the first question is not, you know, do I want to open a restaurant? Do I like to eat? Do I like to cook? But rather, is there a demand for Thai restaurants in Long Beach? How many Thai restaurants are there? How often do people go out to eat? What types of food do they consume when they go out to eat, etc.? Uh, financial resources. Um, do you have uh, the backing to undertake the business, you know, or, or will you need to take out a loan? You know, are the, are the finances there? Um, as we'll see in subsequent chapters, one of the most common causes of business failure is undercapitalization. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. But let's look at the different types of businesses. Um, more and more, as you're no doubt aware, we are moving away from manufacturing into more of a service business foundation for the economy. And this is something that we'll also revisit when we talk about global business, in that, as you're, you're no doubt aware, especially if you've been looking at the news, that oftentimes it makes more sense to manufacture in a cheaper locale that has less expensive labor. Um, the United States seems to be fairly adept at uh, service businesses, but uh, there's a really good link that I'm going to include on Google. Um, so you can think about that in terms of a service business and perhaps some place you want to work out in the future. 
So I mentioned before the definition of profit. This is another area where entrepreneurs often get into trouble in that, you know, to, to abuse the, the restaurant example a little bit further. You know, they, they're out in their first year and they say, oh my gosh, you know, this is, this is fantastic. We've got 80,000 in revenue. Well, revenue is not enough, as you probably know. Um, it's not unusual to not break even the first year or two in business because your expenses, especially expenses out the gate, can't exceed revenue. And if that's the case, you've got a loss. <clears throat> Eventually, the hope is that your revenue will exceed your expenses. And in that case, you would have a profit. So the profit equation is critically important. You may want to write that down. It will no doubt be on the test. Okay, and profit, especially for an entrepreneur, <laughs> um, really is a form of compensation for potentially losing their investment in the business and for those serious risks that they've undertaken. When we look at chapter two, the ethics chapter, and subsequent chapters, of course, we'll come back to the idea of stakeholders. Now, stakeholders are anybody who has a stake in the business. Um, if you're a company like Nike, it's funny, I just bought Nikes last night. Um, you might define your stakeholders as people like me who buy Nikes and your employees. But I would encourage you to think a little bit more broadly. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that the NGOs are non-governmental organizations who are very concerned about working conditions in very various parts of the world, defined themselves as stakeholders of Nike and got very, very upset for what they perceive to be abuse of individuals who were making Nike products in quote unquote sweatshops in various parts of the world. So it's, it's critically important to think very broadly about who your stakeholders are as everybody who has a stake in the business. And those could be um, the folks we just mentioned. They could be stockholders. There's another obvious one. Um, they could be neighbors, you know, your physical neighbors. Are they impacted by noise? Are they impacted by the whatever you're doing that might affect the physical environment? Um, are they affected by parking in front of your business? So as I said, this is an area that a lot of chapter one is kind of setting the stage for the rest of the course. And stakeholders is a very, very important area. Okay, so let's look at economics. Um, is the study of wealth or, or value. I mean, wealth doesn't have to be money. It could be anything that has value. So if you are making the decision with your spouse that one of you will stay home for a few years while the kids are tiny, that is an economic decision. So let me ask you a couple of questions. First, would that be a microeconomic decision or a macroeconomic decision? Let me let you ponder that for a moment. So if you said microeconomic decision, I would agree with you. Um, and I think that's a really good example because yes, you're, you're giving up um, what you could be earning on the job, but you are gaining something of tremendous value, i.e. in that scenario, you know, spending time with your children, watching them grow and shaping them as little humans. So microeconomic decisions are made by individuals and, and businesses. Macroeconomics is the study of national and global economies. Different economic systems will use their factors of production differently. And by factors of production, I mean land and natural resources, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. So, no doubt you're aware that um, the Chinese and the American leadership are holding meetings right now to decide a number of issues. Where would you classify China in terms of economic systems? Well, they answer the basic economic questions differently than the United States. <clears throat> and these economic questions are what goods and services will be produced, how they will be produced, for whom, and who owns and controls the major factors of production. The U.S. has a capitalist system, also referred to as free enterprise, in which individuals are free to decide what to produce, how to produce it, and at what price to sell it. Um, 
In other words, in this economic system, individuals own and operate the majority of businesses that provide goods and services. And Adam Smith coined the idea of the invisible hand. And what that means is if there's demand for a product, you know, let's, let's take the example of donuts. If you decide to open a donut shop, um, if people demand it and you're willing to offer it, the United States government doesn't have to step in and say, thou wilt or wilt not provide donuts and here's the price. You know, quite the opposite. It actually works better to allow supply and demand to meet and to determine the availability of that product and its price. Um, in a laissez-faire or hands-off system, government has a fairly limited role. Which is not to say they have no role, especially in the example I just gave you. Um, we do want donut shops to have some level of regulation because we want to make sure that they're sanitary and not damaging consumers' health. So by virtue of that, the United States is actually a mixed economy. Um, it's not completely laissez-faire because there are rules on the books, you know, for how um, how food safety is handled, how uh, what types of employment standards are in place. Etc. There, there certainly is a role for government. Um, <clears throat> um, these are the, the different groups in a mixed economy, household, business, and government. But let's contrast that with a command economy. A minute ago I mentioned China as an example. Um, so let's go back to my, my scenario. Let's say you decide to open a donut shop. Can you just say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to open a donut shop in Beijing. Well, you know, not so fast. There, there's a good chance, uh, especially if you are a Chinese citizen, that the government would say, you know, donuts? Oh my gosh, what are you thinking? That's really bourgeois. So they certainly have the opportunity to say, we are not going to provide that, that good whatsoever. Because in a command economy, the government decides what goods and services will be produced, how they will pr be produced, for whom, and who owns and controls the, the factors of production. You know, and in this case, it's the government who owns and controls the factors of production. So a command economy can be further subdivided into a more extreme form, which is communism, in which the government owns and controls everything, and socialism, where the government controls certain things. You know, for instance, they may have socialized medicine. They may own certain things, let's say gas stations, but they don't, the government doesn't own everything in a socialist system. So a good example of a socialist country would be Sweden. Uh, in a socialist country, workers can choose their own occupation. The goal is to make things more egalitarian. So small scale private businesses are, are certainly permitted. Um, this is in contrast with a communist system. Case in point, um, Cuba or North Korea or China in a communist system, the government owns, owns and controls virtually everything. Um, you don't get to decide if you open a business. The government gets to decide what your occupation is um, and what your wages will be. So they really do control really all facets of life. Uh, much more, much more extreme version of reality.